everyone. So nice to see you, even though we're not in person. Um, but welcome to the October Houston Beekeepers Association. My name is Sandy Murray. I'm the president. And you have our wonderful board on the phone with us, Nicole, our secretary, Shelly, our treasurer, and Joe, our vice president. And today we have a full agenda. Now, as we get started, we always start with a few kind of opening quick announcements. Um, but we have a wonderful speaker with us today, Kim Flotten, who is out of Ohio, is going to talk with us about what is new in the world of bees. So we're really excited to have him here today. And then as always, we'll follow that with a quick question and answer session. Anything is, is game. You can ask any questions that you'd like. And of course, we have our virtual door raffle prizes at the end. So as we get started today, for those of you who are new to our meetings, uh, Houston Beekeepers Association supports education for beekeepers across Houston and now a little outside of Houston since we're virtual, you can see us anytime. Um, we do meet on a monthly basis and we have dues for families, students, and of course for individuals. It's a low, low price of around $25 or a little bit more. But for all of that, you get lots of goodies and a lot of them are listed here. Our calendar of dues goes from January to uh, December. So we'll be coming up on January soon again so you guys can all renew. And of course, those dues go to these great events um, like having Kim here today and the other speakers that we've had over the last few months. I do want to follow up with you. As you know, we're coming to the end of our calendar year here at Houston Beekeepers Association, which means it's time to select board members. And we have two board members who have been absolutely invaluable over the last year who are actually tenuring out of their positions. So Nicole will, need, will be transitioning out of the treasury role, or excuse me, secretary role. <laughs> and Shelly will be transitioning out of our treasurer role. And they have just done an amazing job. So big kudos to them. We've done so much this year. And of course, transition to this amazing virtual meeting uh, because of our crisis in Houston. Um, but I want to especially thank them. They've been huge proponents of our uh, organization, and I know we'll stay on um, afterwards to help in other ways. Um, but we are looking for two new individuals to get involved in our B board. So if you are interested in uh, supporting in the treasurer role or the uh, secretary role, here are the few things that we all do and support for the board. And of course, if there's any of those type items that you would like to do just out of your um, extra time as a volunteer, if you really like Facebook and YouTube or those or really enjoy writing newsletters, please let us know. We're happy to even have extra hands um, in addition. So for the secretary role, this individual really focuses on our social media and communication for the association. So that's like, you know, the marketing that we do for our events and um, communications to new board, or excuse me, new members. Also our Facebook site, monitoring all the great comments and all the great questions that come in. And so those are some of the core areas for our secretary. For the treasurer, as you can imagine, um, also helping out with membership dues, making sure that we are you know, up to speed on all of our payments as far as accounts payable, running our budget for us, making sure that you know, we're not going over budget in any area. And of course, supporting taxes once a year. And in the past, um, hosting or holding our space reservation uh, at Balin Center. So those are kind of some of the things that our treasurer does. And of course, all of us as a Hey, Sandy, we can't hear you. <laughs> Well, she's still currently connected so that I can see. So Joe, while we're waiting, are all four positions up for re-election each year? Isn't that what the bylaws say? I think that's correct, yeah. Okay. So actually all four are open. There's just availability. No one is running for those two positions. 
Right. I, I believe that's the case. Okay. Just I just wanted to confirm. Sandy is still currently. Oh, she she left us. <laughs> Any questions about anything that we talked about so far? Um, I know Laura asked in the chat, is there a copy of the bylaws? We actually just finalized those this month. Um, Sandy did a lot of work for that. Um, and I uh, signed off on them and sent them to her today. So they are um, awaiting her signature and they should be ready for member viewing. If anyone is interested, it's pretty standard stuff. And I can confirm we're finalizing the, the uh, tax exempt status with the IRS so that we're in compliance. That's excellent. Yeah, we've, we've had a lot of special projects this year. So it's been, um, it's been interesting. <laughs> Including a new website, which is on its way. So pretty exciting stuff. Oh, Sandy's back. back on Sandy. She just got like new uh, cable. Back again. Hey, welcome back. Guys, uh, so since my internet is absolutely not doing very well, I will just close to say if you are interested in being part of our amazing board and being involved in our association for more, please let us know by emailing us at info at Houston Beekeepers Association. And please pick your nominations or your interest in by November the 13th so we can share who all is interested on our November meeting. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kim before I lose internet connection. Kim, you're up. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. I use Zoom at least three times, often four times a week. And when it works, it's wonderful. And when it doesn't, it's awful. But I understand the issues. So thank you for the invitation. It's nice to be in Houston. It's much warmer there than it is where I'm sitting at the moment. And um, I actually sort of wish I was down there. But Sandra, I think maybe you're going to have to I'm not sure. Let's see. Um, Kim, we made you a co-host, so you should be yes. able to share your screen, that's, no problem. That's the way to do it. Cool. You can email me. That gonna work? We don't see your screen yet, Kim. I <clears throat> here we go. And let me get this slideshow. Slideshow, come on. Slideshow in the beginning, and there we are. How's that? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a couple of things tonight, and 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 um, we're gonna start here. Beekeeping 2021 challenge, and where every challenge there's opportunity, and this um, I've gathered this information. Oh, I started putting it together at April Monday last year. And I've been working on it up until this afternoon, actually uh, updating some of these things. But I want to talk about what you can look for, uh, probably starting about tomorrow, but going into the next year. And we're going to talk about honeybee health, the business of pollination, um, enough safe food, too much honey, and not enough bees. And and those are the those are the topics right now that are dominating what's going on. Uh, pretty much in the, in, the, in the beekeeping industry, not only in the US, but a lot of it's um, 
more global than I'd like to I'd like to uh, imagine. But so let's get started on Honey Bee Health. Let's see if I remember how to advance the slide. There we go. You got to have healthy bees, and I got to move this box. Here we go. Where to? You got to have healthy bees and a clean home to to keep bees. I mean that's just a given. Um, I wish it was that easy to do, and therein lies the issue. The best way to have healthy bees is probably the worst make the worst way to make honey. You can be treating, you can be ma managing, you can use chemicals, you can use no chemicals, you can use IPM, but all of the time that you're dealing with 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 managing uh, pest populations, you're dismantling the beehive colony in terms of its ability to make and store honey. It's kind of an either or, and you're just going to have to, and it's going to get more like that than not uh, over the next few years. But if you can, if you're, if you're into using chemicals, then you've got, you know, you can't have them on when you've got honey on. And you've got, if you're using chemicals, you're contaminating wax and potentially contaminating your honey crop. If you're not using chemicals, uh, you still have to know. You still have to know what your mite population is, what's going on with nozema and, and the other things that are in the hive. And if you're managing your bees without chemicals, you're doing IPM, you're trapping drones, you're doing walkaway splits, you're doing those sorts of things. Um, that's going to disrupt your honey production, major, major, big time. So you, you can either have healthy bees in a clean home, or you can have honey, but you can't have either. Um, and that's pretty much pretty much the case. Um, it's certainly something that's going to continue to be an issue um, over the next several years. So uh, if you if you are using chemicals for mites, you know, know that know the label instructions, do what they say, don't do it when they say not to do it. Um, always know your mite population, always, always, always know your mite population. And the reason for that is, is because uh, mite populations can literally explode. And if you're doing IPM or chemicals and you're not watching it, suddenly it, they get way ahead of you and you've got to essentially have a dead hive. They just don't know it yet. Um, so uh, the the easy check thing that you see there calls for a half a cup of bees. You don't have to use a half a cup of bees. You can use, you can use a, a third of a cup or a quarter of a cup. Just know how many bees you're using when you do that. I don't like killing bees with alcohol. A bit, not one bit, but it's fast and easy and a good way to do it, and it's fairly reliable. I suggest if you're going to use alcohol wash, if you haven't done it yet or you've only done it a few times, here's something. Here's a procedure to consider: is know how many bees went in the 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 uh, container, uh, put on the right, put in the right amount of alcohol and shake for a minute, and then drain the alcohol and the mites out and count the mites now. Put that alcohol back in and shake it again and see how good you were the first time. If you missed quite a few, you know that you're not shaking enough and you need to shake harder and longer. And you won't know that if you don't go back and check. If you shake it once and you get two and you say, ah, cool. You go back and you shake it again and you get four more, then you know you've got a problem and you're going to have to initiate some sort of uh, mite management uh, program. So. You have to have healthy bees in a clean home, and and the biggest one of the biggest issues we have in this country right now is contaminated beeswax. There is no clean beeswax in the United States, pretty much, pretty much other than the cappings you talk, took off your hive if you don't use chemicals. That's going to be the clean beeswax. But in terms of commercial use of beeswax, all the foundation you see, the found, the wax that goes on wax plastic foundation, the wax that's burned in candles, it's all got. It's all got something in it, and 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 the the biggest problem with that is, it's not much, you know. I mean, we're talking parts per billion, and you if you don't uh, um, if you're not moving your high your frames out of your hives every couple three years at the most, uh, I recommend two. The the bees are living in a constant pesticide soup, and I I I I I, I, I compare it to. When I'm talking to beginners and anybody, it's it, would you put your children to bed at night knowing that you're covering them up with a blanket that's only a couple of billion parts per million poison? Because that's what you're doing. And and if you're using chemicals, you got to get that stuff out of there fast, two years, and 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 that's it. Um, 
because the stuff that you, the wax that you put in there already had some already, unless you're doing no, no foundation frames, in which case you've got a little bit bigger window, but not much. Um, three, three years, maybe. But um, if you have the, if you have the ability and the opportunity to test your wax, the USDA has an office, you can find that. There's other places. Um, uh, Texas A&M has some facilities, I believe. Take your old frame and send them a sample and see what's in it. And then and then go out and and run out and change your old frames, your old foundation or your old uh, comb out of there. So healthy bees in a clean home. And if you're gonna take really good care of healthy bees, it's gonna be harder, not impossible, but harder to make honey. Just know that going in and you won't be disappointed. Okay. All right. Why won't my slide advance? Like I said, Zoom is really good when it works. My slide isn't advancing. <laughs> well, let's see. We may have to go back to the beginning here. Hang on. If you unshare your screen and then reshare it, that'll do it. Um, I've got the option to new share. Is that what you mean? I don't have an unshare. Uh, just stop sharing and then and then start again. Let's see if that works. Uh, hmm, there we go. Okay, this is this is the business of pollination, and and here's what's going on with the business of pollination. I don't. I, I apologize for that ripple in the in the Zoom program there. My slide wouldn't advance, but um, the the business of pollination in this country and in some several other countries is taking on a new. Um, a new part of keeping bees. And, and the reason, if we're going to look at the reason for it in a minute, but basically it is what drives income from a, bee, from a commercial beekeeping operation. This is where commercial beekeepers are, most commercial beekeepers are making most of their money is in some sort of pollination. We're going to get to some other crops that they're raising also, but um, knowing, knowing that if, if, if you're gonna, if you're, you're competing, if you're a commercial beekeeper, you're competing against foreign honey at 90 some cents a pound, and it's costing you two and a half to 260 a pound to, to make, and that's breaking even. If you can sell it for two, for 250 a pound, you're not losing any money, but you're not making any money. And if you're not losing any money, you're not, you really are losing money because you've got the time invested in it. So here's, here's, Here's what's going on with with uh, pollination. There's a lot of things if you're going to get into this, even on a small scale. You know, four colonies and a pickup down the road to a to a, I don't know, a fruit farm of some kind. You've got moving stress, and 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 sharing. You know, you can see how many beehives are in that holding yard in California. Care to count them? Every one of those beehives after a month has all of the bad things that every one of those other beehives brought with them to California. So after you've been there for a month, everybody's got the same level of stuff going on in their hives. Pests, predators, diseases, you name it. Also look at the uh, amount of forage that's sitting out there. You see anything to eat? So what you're doing is you are subjecting those bees to essentially high fructose corn syrup and some sort of pollen substitute, protein substitute. Uh, okay food, but certainly not honey or pollen. And so there's that stress. Um, there's, there's, if you go down the bottom of the pesticide stress, they're still learning what's not good for bees and almonds, believe it or not, but also every other crop that exists. And then the new ones come along. And then the ones that are, that are systemic, that the bees are just barely introduced to, but they're barely introduced to a little bit of poison. So you've got that stress. Um, if you get lucky and you're able to and you're able to find uh, a place that's safe, maybe another pollination job, you might have some good food. 
Uh, the money is what drives this though. Um, uh, working with uh, some ag economists in, in, uh, Bur or in um, California looking at, at almond contracts and, and they're beginning to look real, real carefully at what almond growers are looking for in a pollination contract and what beekeepers are looking for and what, what each need to stay to stay in business. And one of the things that came out of this interestingly was, was would it be more opportune, would it be better business to, instead of having a colony that's eight frames or greater into an almond orchard, have it six frames or so. It would cost you much less to get your colony into that, into that field. They've shown that a six frame hive does pretty much as good as an eight frame hive. It would cost the beekeeper less to get it ready. It would cost the almond grower less to uh, to rent it. So, right now, that's that, that's a big that's a big issue uh, in almond pollination. But it's going to hit every other crop. Once somebody else sees it and says, you know, I don't, if I don't have to do this much work uh, and I can get the same money, or I can get a little bit less money but spend way less money, uh, what am I going to do? So this is going to ripple through the pollination business pretty much. I think the whole world, but certainly the U.S. next spring. Uh, but right now. Pollination is the driver for uh, income for beekeepers. There's no doubt about it. And, and um, this isn't going to go away and it's only going to get bigger. Let's see if we, ah, the slide advanced work. Good. Um, of course, this is one of the other problems that's going on enough safe food. Where do you find um, enough safe food? Enough safe food for all of the beekeepers. One of the things that's going on right now is, is, has been a, uh, I don't want to say a battle, but certainly a lot of discussion between beekeepers and people who run, who are running national parks and national forests and, and government-owned land. Because on government-owned land, there's no pesticides and you can put bees in there and they're safe. But the people who are dealing with all of the rest of the insects on the government own land, Xerxes and all of those are saying, if you put that many bees in here, you're going to start challenging the native bee population and they're not going to have enough to eat. So, you know, and, and, and if you want to be real callous about this, I can look at this and say, okay, I'm going to put my bees on a, in a, in a, in a place like this and the, and the native bees aren't going to have enough to eat, or I can put them in some place in regular agriculture and they're just going to be stressed and die and we won't have enough to eat. Take your pick. And that's that's the argument that's going on. I don't know what what it's how it's going to end, uh, but you can see how how much land in the US is used for what kinds of what kinds of uh, uses and and right now um, the land that is the safest for bees, enough safe food is being challenged by people who are looking at what's going on with the native bees and other native insects um, in that in, in those areas. So it's 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 not just it's not decided. I don't know if it will be decided. I don't know when it will be decided. But if you've got a place um, that has safe food all year round that you're real comfortable with, don't tell anybody, because because you got you got a you got a gold mine there. Here's, here's one of the things that um, I was talking about earlier, um, how much honey is consumed in the US. We did 585 million pounds in two, 2019. That's uh, domestic produced, imported, uh, supplies held over from last year. Uh, that you put all that together and, and 580, we, could, uh, we consume 585 million pounds. Of that, the US produced 27% at on average 250 a pound. 73% was imported at on, on an average of 94 cents a pound. You can see why beekeepers, commercial beekeepers are looking at honey production as, I'm not, I don't think this is gonna be a winning business here. And, and indeed it's, it's a challenge, a real challenge. Mostly you have honey because that's what bees do and you end up with some and you gotta do something with it, but you're not gonna make a profit on it when, when you take it to a packer and he says, yeah, I'll give you a buck and a half for it. That's the best I can do because I've got 94 cent pound from, from you know, wherever, India, China, Venezuela, 
Um, so honey production is going to be going to be changing in this country. And the other half of that is that there as few there are fewer places to make just to make honey. You just there's just not that much land. You saw that map before and how much of it the cities and roads and 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 commercial land and all the other things that that land gets used for that don't doesn't produce honey. So not only is there fewer place are there fewer places to put bees, but if you find a place, the honey that you're going to make is you're going to have to sell at a loss. So you can see why this is not going to be a, a really good, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, this isn't going to be a really good um, business model for beekeepers to pursue. Well, there's not enough bees. Believe it or not, with all that's going on, um, there's, 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 since people are now pollinating, they need more colonies for pollination and they need, they need, they're either raising bees for themselves to pollinate or they're raising bees to sell to other pollinators. The bulk uh, bees and the package and new producers for beginners and queen producers are short of bees, critically short every year. Um, they're produced basically in two parts of the U.S. and most of the West Coast burns this year. So that's going to be even more of a challenge. Uh, the ones down south, uh, Gulf Coast area, doing okay, but they got, you've got, uh, in the, lurking in the back of your mind should be the a Africanized honeybee gene that sits down there. Not much of it, but enough. So just raising bees, healthier colonies, fewer mites and virus, less moving stress, better overwintering, better food, better care, better queens, better bees. That's just, uh, you can sell a package of bees. We're gonna talk about this in a minute. You can sell a package of bees for 30 bucks a pound or I can sell honey uh, for 220 a pound. Um, you don't have to be a, a math whiz to see how that works out in the long run by the end of the year. So selling bees and selling queens um, is is a is a growing a much a much faster growing part of commercial beekeeping, and and all of you out there are gonna I'm gonna bet that almost all of you out there are gonna start looking for bees, oh maybe tomorrow, because because uh, you know that there's not gonna be enough bees. So um, keep that in mind when you're looking to expand or when you're looking to replace is where am I going to get bees and how much are they going to cost me? Let's see if we can get this done. So there you are, uh, beekeeping 2021. Um, and that, like I said, these are just some of the highlights that are coming into coming into play, mostly in the commercial industry, but what, what comes in the commercial industry filters down to everybody that's got a bee in a box someplace. I didn't even talk about wintering. Um, and, and that is moving to the front also. The next time I do this, we'll probably have to have a wintering slide because wintering is changing significantly. Where you are doesn't count. You're lucky down there. But where I am and where most of the bees live most of the year, most of the year winter, uh, winter is hard enough that, that uh, we have to look at it. And indoor, the science of indoor wintering is growing exponentially as we talk. Uh, the, the gases and the rooms and the lights and all of that. And, and then how do you get bees, how do you get bees to lay eggs when they're in the dark and, and, and cool, but not cold. And all of that science is being worked on as we speak. And pretty soon, I think it will probably be um, hardly any bees outside anymore in the winter north of the Mason Dixon line. I wanna go on now that you've got this and, and um, we talked earlier about about getting bees, and and I want to I want to look at this two ways. There's several ways that you can get bees. You can you can catch a swarm if you're lucky. You can buy a full size hive. You can buy a package of bees, or you can buy a nuke. And and buying a nuke or a package is probably certainly financially more reasonable than buying a full size hive. And, and probably easier to deal with, especially if you're just getting started or only have been going at it a little bit. You don't, you're, not buying a, you're not buying a full speed ahead box of bees. You're buying a getting out of first and into second gear box of bees. And, and I wanna look at the difference between packages. If you have an option where you are, the difference between packages and, and, and uh, nukes. And with a nuke 
Over there on the left, you get about three pounds of multi-aged workers. Now think about that. I've got a, I got a, I got the whole the whole profile of a beehive in that nuke. I've got nurse bees. I've got I've got cleaning bees. I've got foragers. I've got bees that take care of the queen. I've got all of those bees in that in that hive, and they're already ready. They're already accepted that queen. You've got you've got um, a laying queen because and you and you've got brood because she's laying. So you've got bees to take care of brood that you already have. You've got drawn comb, which is, if you don't know it by now, you will soon learn the most expensive piece of equipment in your beekeeping, your beekeeping life is a frame of drawn comb. It has, it caught, you can't believe what it costs a colony to make a frame of drawn comb. So you've already got that. And you've got both kinds of food. You've got stored pollen and you've got stored honey. It probably, probably some high fructose corn syrup in there, but at least you've got both kinds of food already there, ready to go. In a package, you get about three pounds of worker bees that are all about the same age, which means that, which means that um, you, the bees that are gonna, the bees now that were foragers are maybe foragers, but all of the bees that are in the rest of the, the line of jobs to do, don't have anything to do. So, so they either have to learn what to do or they have to, you have, um, that's it. They have to learn what to do. So you got a time lag there. Um, you've got a brand new unaccepted queen. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to guess that if I ask how many people here today have been having troubles with queens in the last three or four years, I'd see a lot of wave raised hands. Um, and a nuke, you've got probably a queen that's already accepted and laying and doing what she should be in a package it's a crapshoot you have no idea probably okay especially if you know the producer but are you going to bet on it so so if you get a package that's what you're doing you you're going to bet on it plus that queen is going to take well you know i'm i'm telling when i learned to keep bees decades ago um, you put the you put the queen in a package and you left her for three days and then you came back and then you removed the cork and you let the bees eat the candy and release her. And with the problems that people are having with queens getting accepted right now, pretty much you want to wait a week and I wait if seven or eight I eight or nine days before I go in and remove that cork and then I'm gonna check real hard to make sure that they're accepting her. Are they are they? You know, still biting the cage, are they still trying to get at her? So I want to make sure that that queen is accepted. So there's a week after I got this package. And if if after after a week or 10 days she's out and then she starts laying, it's going to be three more weeks before you have any before you have any adult bees. So you're looking at a month before anything happens in, in your in your package. And Am I unmuted now? Okay, I'm sorry. I I didn't know I did that. Anyway, it was me. It was me. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Um. So you've got this. You've got this time lapse of no brood in your colony. Uh, your bees are doing some foraging. They're building, and and if you're putting them on foundation, they're they're foraging like mad to get enough food to produce enough wax to make comb so that when she starts, you know, by the time she starts laying, there's enough comb there for her to work with and that'll continue to expand. Um, you've got no food in that container other than if you can see the, uh, the cans of the syrup that come with those new plastic packages, there's no comb probably, and there's no brood. So all things, oops, all things, hang on. Ah, there we go. All things considered, uh, even when you look at the cost difference, um, what's going to be your better bet? And and um, I, without uh, with not even a second's hesitation, a nuke is a better way to start keeping bees if you can afford it and it works in your operation and your backyard and your game plan. But um, all things being equal, a nuke is a better choice. You're going to pay a little bit more for it, but there's a much less chance that you're going to lose it before the end of the season. So 
for those of you who are going to be starting next year, it's something that I would recommend looking at. Talk to your mentor, talk to your group when you have a meeting and see what other people in your group think. But I'm going to bet that that given a choice, most people would prefer a nuke. You're looking at the two different kinds of packages you may get there now. The one on the top is the old wooden box with screen sides package, and they're nailed together for support so you can carry more than one or two at a time. Uh, the cost of the materials for that are, I'm going to say, almost free. However, the labor to construct them is astronomical compared to the plastic package that you see down below. The cost of material for that plastic package is as higher for the box up above, but the assembly time is essentially zero. All things considered, the plastic package from a, from a package producer's perspective is cheaper. The downside is you got, you've got to recycle them. You can't, there's no second use for these. Um, and and, uh, and I, I'm hoping somebody can figure out a way to, to fix that because that package goes into a plastic, you know, something recycled wherever you are and, and that's the end of it, which is too bad because we got too much plastic anyway. But those are the two kinds of packages you're gonna see. And one of the things that you, you, you may know um, about that plastic package is it's so much easier to use for the beekeeper. That end that you're looking at, the narrow end that you're looking at, folds down and you just pour the bees up. You don't have to shake them out through that through that uh, feed hole on the top, banging them against the, the partition inside in the top of the cage and pouring them and turning and you just open the end and dump them out. It's really a lot easier and, and a lot easier on the bees. So if you're looking at a package and you have an, you have an option, the, the bee bus it's called, the white plastic is a lot better on the bees. It has some downsides. The other one is common in some places and you may not have a choice, but there you are. If you're gonna get bees next spring, nukes or packages, the advantages of nukes I think are pretty obvious. Uh, there are some advantages to packages when it comes to finances. So however you wanna look at it, but at least know going in with your eyes open that there are differences and advantages and disadvantages. Uh, uh, here's, a, here's a way to look at this uh, to help you visualize the package. You're going to start with, you know, some, it's about 10,000 bees, about 3,000 bees a pound. And, and that you're going to start with that and five, uh, if you're lucky, drawn uh, combs, probably not, maybe five frames of foundation. What you have to get to uh, by late October is you need all of these frames with honey. Uh, ready to go, ready to go and, and uh, into winter. You can see the challenge um, where a, a package starting out with essentially no available resources and you're gonna have to supply everything all summer long pretty much as opposed to a nuke. And, and uh, so keep that kind of in mind when you're looking at um, starting out with bees next spring. Um, so using nukes, if you go this route, and I, I, I really recommend that you do, but, but um, even if you don't know that maybe next year you will, and, or maybe you'll stumble upon one for sale or something and you decide to go, let's, talk, let's take a look at using nukes. Um, and, and I'm gonna be honest, what a nuke is, is a bee supply store in your bee yard. Everything you need, everything you need to keep bees is in that nuke. And if you have two or three, you're never gonna run out. So let's take a look at using nukes. Um, and, and there are several, several times and ways to make them. And I, I'm gonna be honest, some of my timing are more north, northern oriented than as far south as you guys are. So uh, kind of take that, give me a break and kind of take that in, 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 uh, in stride as we're talking about the seasons and the time of the year. But if you make a, if you make a, um, um, a split in early spring, just as drones begin to emerge, um, for either for, to, for making a nuke or for swarm management or for both. And this is one of the things when a colony doesn't start to think about swarming until drones start to emerge. So if you're a half a step ahead of them on that, you've 
auto automatically removed a lot of the stimulus for that colony to swarm because you've removed you've lowered the drone population. What you want to do is take two frames of whoops two frames of open uh, and eggs one sealed and open one comb chock full of just bees one honey and a pollen and one foundation or comb. Um, you want a nice balance of of the population. You want the balance in that nuke. You want the population in that nuke to resemble very as close as you can the balance of the population in the colony that you took it from. You want you want you want frames with eggs and little larvae and medium-sized larvae and large larvae and sealed brood. You want young, just emerged bees, and you want older uh, bees ready to forage. You want a queen that's laying. Wait a minute, we're going to talk about that. You want a queen, uh, and that may be where we're going to where you're going to get her, but that's that's what you want that new that split that you're going to make to look like is a, a, a mirror image only smaller of the colony that you took it from and you add a queen or a swarm cell or you buy a queen cell or you let them raise their own however you're going to get a queen if you know I, we have some ohio local queens that are pretty good and we have some indiana queens which are close enough that are really good and if you can buy a local queen that, that you, you're confident in the genetics in, then that's the way to go. So you can buy a, a queen or a swarm cell because um, if, you buy a, if you take a swarm cell from that colony that you were splitting, at least you know the genetics um, of, the, of, the, of the queen that's going to come out of there because it came from the queen that was in that colony. And if she was a good queen, the, the likelihood of the swarm cell queen being at least as good is, are pretty good. You can buy queen cells from local beekeepers, that may help, or let them just raise their own from, from uh, eggs that were in that colony. And there again, you're gonna get, you're, you know half of the genetics. And if, you're, if your goal is to begin to look at local bees to produce um, you know, mite resistance or production or gentleness or whatever it is uh, traits you're looking for, if the queen, met those things and you've got at least some other colonies in the area the chances that uh, she'll mate with somebody you know um, are pretty good so you may end up with, a, with another good queen but you have to you got a queen in there somehow so the parent that you took him from leave the original queen because she was good doing you know i mean if they were if they were thinking that they were getting ready to swarm then that colony is doing well and you want them to to, to uh, uh, prosper fill the void with foundation or comb on the outside of the box uh, move your move the frames that are left to the center of the box and put your new frames on the outside and then feed 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 both carbs and protein um, of course honey from other colonies honey you save uh, in frames is always the best. So is frames of full of pollen. How many people here wrap pollen? Yeah, it's amazing. I'm 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 completely flummoxed at at this. Pollen is the best free food you can get. <laughs> and, and 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 put a put a pollen trap on one of your colonies next year. Get a good uh, pollen trap. And put it on one of your colonies next year and trap pollen for a day and turn it off for two and trap pollen for a day and turn it off for two. And the stuff that you trap, take it, put it in a plastic bag, squish it down and put it in your freezer. You don't have to clean it. You don't have to do anything with it. And it's free food. It's the best free food you can get. So, so you will pay for that pollen trap the first year that you have it. And every year after that, it will be a bonus in terms of the the best free food you can get to feed your bees. So if you're gonna feed this colony, feed it honey and pollen if you can, but the protein substitutes um, will work, but, but get a pollen trap. Um, all kinds of boxes work. You know, you can have uh, upper left-hand corner, you can take a 10 frame box and get three frames in there. You can put five frames, there's all sorts of, containers that you can put them in. You can put a, you can put a five frame nuke in a 10 frame box and just put separators between them so that they just stay in those five frames. But it, it, it's much less important of uh, what kind of container that you put them in uh, than that you get them separated somehow and the container is, is weather worthy and all of those things. Okay, that's early spring splits. 
if you're going to make a late spring split after swarming, but before your main flow, um, um, watch for swarming. Rob each split to make even more splits. Can you do this? The when you've got a colony that's that's recovered from swar the swarm period, it really begins to grow, and it's getting ready for the main flow. And that's when you can really really milk that colony for its resources. And this is probably a colony you're not going to make a drop of honey from, but you're going to you're going to take. Uh, brood from it, you're going to take bees from it, you may take queens from it, but these are the colonies after the main or before the main flow that are just just bursting with energy. That's what you want. You want the energy. You're not quite too concerned about the amount of bees, but they're in the mood to make more bees and to make lots of food. So you can you can take you can do that or you can take you know a, a frame from each of five different splits that fill up the, the profile that you want in terms of brood and bees. Um, and and there's, there's, we could be here until, until the cows come home telling where you can get these resources from. If you've got three colonies, you've got nine splits, now suddenly you've got 18 colonies, if you wanna look at it that way. This is, this is, this is the most fun of beekeeping from my perspective. I enjoy this more than anything. Building, building a split that resembles its parent and has all of the things that it needs and you're, you're, you're swapping frames and you got bees in the air and it's always a nice day. And it's, it's one of the neatest jobs you will ever have when it comes to what you're doing is you're, 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 you're Taking the resources that your early bees have made, you are you are separating those resources into smaller units. You are making yourselves more colonies. You are making yourselves the bee uh, uh, bee store and a bee yard splits to help other colonies. You're making splits that you can sell. Remember what I said about selling bees instead of selling honey. Here's where this comes in. You can be selling some of these splits. And, and once you've bought a split, you know that it's going to cost more than a than a than a package. So you're looking at you're looking at some financial stability here if you can start keep start and keep making splits the whole summer until. Well, I have to quit in August. I don't know when you do, and 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 that's my problem. But I have to quit in August because August is is that's the beginning of winter for me. Winter starts in August for me up here. That's what I'm looking at. So whenever you start thinking of August um, or whenever you start thinking of winter and you're not thinking of winter now, it's October, come on. Um, uh, uh, anyway, I, I, I quit in August because I wanna look at mite issues. I wanna look at queen issues and I wanna look at uh, combining wheat colonies or whatever. But by August, I'm done with this activity. You can make summer splits. Um, and this is, from my perspective, where I'm at, probably the best varroa control there is. And, and um, you got that, you, 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 after the summer solstice, when the days start getting shorter, life in the colony changes and you get a break in the brood cycle. It's great for varroa reduction for the new colony because there's no brood for a period of time, only eggs and adults and sealed brood. So if you let that, so Vroa have nowhere to go. So they're exposed at, during, this, during this time. At, at, shortly after you do this, they're exposed. They've got nowhere to go. And, and no matter what you're doing with, with, uh, with control, this is their most vulnerable point, without a doubt. So I, I like it. I mean, they, they, they starve by the thousands, they fall off, they can't get back up, they're just helpless and it's just wonderful to watch. Uh, but but, but this, is a, this is the best raw control that I use. I trap drones and I do summer splits and spring splits, but I do summer splits for raw control. Let the nuke requeen itself. And, and that's because of the time that it takes for them to select the eggs, to produce the cell, to let it mature. To let her out and to and to get mated and to start laying, um, that's a, that's the time period you're looking for, is that time period of no no sealed brood in the colony, 
So you can let the new queen itself, or you can you can let it develop queen cells and then introduce the queen that you want just before they, and then maybe use those queen cells in other nukes that you've developed that don't have queens. So there's a lot of ways you can use this. Like I said, this is a bee supply store. There's stuff that you can take all the time and, and use somewhere else to make life better for the rest of your bees. Using nukes reduces swarming if it's split before the swarm season. And, and before the swarm season, I mean, uh, we were talking earlier, before drones start to emerge, before the bees begin to think that uh, maybe it's crowded in here, maybe there's not a, enough queen pheromone, before that happens, that's when you want to make that split. You want to you get in there and get out of there before they even begin to think of it, and then they'll never think of it. Um, and one of the things to think about uh, when you've got a crowded colony is there's a lot of, a lot of factors that, that aid in and, and why a colony is good, uh, promotes a colony to swarm. One of them, of course, is, is the, uh, the queen pheromone. And if you want to look at it this way, think of it that, that a queen produces X amount of pheromone. And as she gets older, that X gets a little bit smaller, but there's X amount of queen pheromone per bee in the colony. And the more bees in the colony you get, the less queen pheromone you get and the less effect it has on them thinking about swarming. So. Uh, it, 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 uh, a, a, a split is going to reduce congestion. It reduces the population of both adults and brood. So, so you, that colony has less, less, fewer adults, but has less brood to, for the remaining adults to, to feed. Yet the ratio, again, look at that ratio of, of young and old bees and, and eggs and, and open and sealed brood. Um, and then you can requeen them both or you can you can requeen only one, or you can leave the queen. I mean, there's a there's a hundred ways to go here. None of them are wrong. They're just what fits your plan, or what resources do I have today, and what can I do with what I've got sitting here in front of me before I have to go home and go to supper. So that's one thing to look at it. Uh, if you've got two or three of these small colonies sitting in the back someplace. Uh, they're they're just kind of chugging along, but but every time you go to the bee yard, you're going to rob them of a frame of brood, a frame of bees, a frame of honey, a frame of pollen. Uh, for your your bigger colonies that are producing and making honey or making bees for you, whichever it is that you're 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 uh, re you're replacing, but but you're managing the nuke as a full-size colony, but you keep removing stuff from it. So they just have to keep chugging. I, I, I think if I was a bee in a nuke that was in my bee yard, I'd go on strike because you'd never give me a rest. But um, that's that's where I, when I've said that nukes are a bee supply store in your, in your bee yard, that's every time you go to your bee yard, you can add something to your production colonies. You can add a little bit of brood if, if things will slow down or you can add some honey if you've got a little bit of a dearth or something but that that nuke is is it's free um you, your your production colonies are going to need it and are going to like it and your nuke is just going to go oh well here we go again but here we go again so they'll continue to produce the things that you need for your production colonies and it doesn't cost you a penny you can requeen a production colony with an entire nuke and I've done this a lot of times. You just take you take five frames that don't have a lot of brood in them or any brood in them uh, out of your production colony, and you put your nuke in. And suddenly, you know, you can do this a bunch of ways. You can do you can put the nuke on top in a sheet of newspaper. There's a lot of ways you can do this. But but suddenly, you, your colony doesn't go queenless. Suddenly it was, it was almost, and now you've added the queen, you've added bees, you've added brood, and suddenly this colony is right back where it started. Thank you very much. Um, so, so look at it that way. You, you know, if you got a colony, if you got a full-size production colony that went queenless and you didn't catch it for two weeks, you know, suddenly you've got a real problem. You could fix that right now by putting that nuke in and and with the population of bees that from that nuke to go into that colony i've never had a problem with the bees in the in the receiving colony hassling the queen i'm not going to say it won't happen but i've never had that problem so so 
Um, I think you can do it without any trouble. You can do the paper method of joining colonies and you can go through all that rigmarole, but when you're replacing half the bees in a colony with bees from the nuke, pretty much things straighten out right now. Um, you, uh, like I said, you can replace failing queens when queens aren't available. If you've got, if you've overwintered a couple of these nukes and you, your main production colony went queenless in the winter, bingo. Suddenly you have a production colony again because you've taken that, the queens or some of the frames of bees and brood from that nuke and you put it in your production colony. They'll go on and raise something of their own, but your production colony, you know, um, is ready to go just that fast without having to find somebody that's got a queen, get it in there, get her accepted. Um, the, the, the downtime is a lot shorter. Uh, the other thing that you can you can get from nukes is is drawn comb. You can put you can put foundation in them and just make them draw comb all summer long, and and they're they're they'll they'll do it. And so you've got you know all that stuff that you're getting rid of because it had poison in it. This is where you get the comb to replace it. It's expensive in terms of bee labor, but the colony that's producing it isn't producing that instead of honey for you or that instead of bees for you. The nuke is producing it and it's sitting in the back and it's free, it's free. You can produce brood if you need a jump in, in uh, population. You can produce bees, honey, pollen. All of these things nukes are supplying because that's what they do. And you can take it from them and give them to colonies that, you, that are short of it or that you wanna boost. They're, they're an expendable resource for everything you need to supplement, support, or aid full-size colonies. And they're expendable at the end of the season if you want. Simply combine them with a full-size colony or take three of, the, three of them and put them together and you've got a full-size colony going into winter. It, it didn't cost you anything and you get a colony at the end of the season to go over winter with. So it's, it's, just, it's just, to me, it's just a, a real simple concept. Um, well, like I said, you can get queens from, you know, you can put, uh, you can take a queen from a nuke for an emergency use. If the co your production colony, you were in there with a hive tool and, and careless, you can, you know, take a, take a queen out of your nuke and introduce her just like you would a regular queen that you just got from somebody else. It's going to take a while, but the colony that you had that was going is probably going to go pretty strong anyway. It's got eggs and brood and, and foragers and food. So by the time that queen is accepted, they're not going to have lost very much. Um, and and you, can, you, can, you can even even supply them with some brood from that nuke that you took the queen from and let that nuke raise their own queen again. Again, and then and the, the nice thing about that is the nuke is a weak colony, small weak colony, and it has, and it has, um, trouble with wax moth and varroa and, and small hive beetles. It has all of the troubles that, that every colony has and because it's small, it, it's more of a trouble for them. So, so that's one of the things that you have to look for in a, in a small colony that you're challenging this population all of the time is those are the things that are gonna give you trouble. It's gonna be mites, it's gonna be wax moth and it's gonna be small hive beetles. And I know you have small hive beetles way worse than I do. I saw my first one two weeks ago. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, for me, small hive beetles aren't much of a challenge, but I know that they are where you are. So that's one thing you have to watch. You can sell overwintered nukes, the ones that, that made it through the winter, you know, for a premium price. You can sell spring splits, late spring splits, summer splits. You can sell queens and cells. You can sell brood bees. Sometimes uh, if you've got a friend, it's, you know, you can pull four frames of brood out of two nukes and sell them, sell them those frames of brood uh, for their colonies that are languishing. And, and your bees are just going to raise more brood. Now his bees or her bees are going to be you know, going to be better. So, I mean, it is a money making proposition to have three or four nukes in your bee yard. There's just no doubt about it. It's going to save you money, make you money, and and uh, help all of your bees all the time. Are there problems? Yes. We talked about small hive beetles. Um, and and uh, small hive beetles have advanced more than I'm keenly aware of. I use traps 
you know, the little V-shaped ones that go between the frames. And for the population of beetles that we have, that works. But I know you get a lot of beetles and you get them on inner covers and all those jails and all of those other things. Uh, they can be an issue, but it's, a, it's with a with a nuke you can be aggressive trapping them. You don't have to worry too much about about how much you're going to interfere with the rest of the colony when you're dealing with the beetles, because the rest of the colony, you know, it's just going to do what it's going to do, and and if it doesn't thrive, it's still okay for you. But but a, a small nuke for me is is a problem because of wintering. And I almost, I'm not going to say never, but I almost never overwinter a five frame nuke. I'm going to combine it with a couple more five frames and end up with a two story, or I'm going to join it to a full size colony. I, I've, I learned keeping bees in Wisconsin a lot of years ago. And, and Wisconsin, the, the, the USDA bee lab in Wisconsin was, they were, they were bound and determined to learn how to winter bees better. And so I learned a lot about wintering bees, insulation and, and ventilation or no ventilation, water, all of those things. So I got a pretty good feel of how to overwinter. And I probably could overwinter a five frame nuke if I wanted to put a lot of time and energy and resources into insulation and all of that. I don't. So I just join it with a big colony and I don't care because they're going to do just fine. So, um, but a nuke's going to have all of the problems that small weak colonies are going to have. Like I said, I use I use the traps for high beetles, um, and I keep them as strong as I can. I will, on occasion, take frames of brood uh, or bees from a producing colony and put it into a nuke. When I've when I was overzealous last week and I took more than I should have, I may give some back um, because because it's only right. And and um, wax moth. Well, they've got certain re-registered, re um, and and I think I think that's going to help um, keep wax moth out of colonies. I don't know. Do you know what's? Are you aware of certain? It's it's the bacteria that you use in your garden for for caterpillars. What is it called? I, but it's that stuff, and it 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 kills it kills wax moth larvae deader deader than nails in a in a, in a heartbeat. So you can treat your frames with it. Your, you can treat your bees with it. It doesn't bother seven your dust. bees. I'm sorry. Is it seven dust? No, no, it's not a poison. It's a bacteria. Hmm. And and um, it's the stuff that organic gardeners spray their cabbage with to get rid of to get rid of um, cabbage moth. And it's a bacteria that attacks the larva. And and you can spray your bees with it. The lar the bacteria don't mind, don't do anything. It doesn't contaminate your wax. Doesn't contaminate your honey. Um, it's it's not free. But if you've got a wax moth problem on small colonies, look into this because it might be something you want to consider. Mm -hmm. um, keeping strong, uh, of course, is is the best way. But if you can't, and then you go and and you you know do do join it with a stronger colony or use something like certain um, you can winter them over you can winter them over a strong colony and I sometimes do that with a double screen I put a double screen on top and and um, uh, just let the heat from the colony blow um, envelop the the uh, the uh, nuke above you got to have an upper entrance and I don't like having an upper entrance very much because then you've got ventilation issues but it can be done and, and you've got to wrap the bunch. Um, uh, and that's why I'll go back to wintering in Wisconsin. When we wintered in Wisconsin, we put four colonies together on a pallet and sealed them tight. And we sealed them with four inches of, I forget whatever the R value of the uh, was, but they didn't, they didn't cluster in the winter. They were warm enough. And you can, I can do that with my colonies here. That's something you guys don't have to worry about. No, <laughs> it's always warm enough here as long as there's a good, <laughs> size colony. <laughs> <clears throat> so when you're looking, if you're, if you're just starting out and you've got some options yet and you're looking at a nuke or a package or a full-size hive, look, look hard at a nuke because it, it, it's, it, it, it has so many useful purposes uh, and it can make you money. A, a, a package is gonna, gonna la you know, it's gonna um, uh, drag on for a long time before it finally gets going. A full-size colony, you hit the ground running. And if you're ready for that, that's okay. But a lot of us weren't when we first started out. 
So a nuke may be a, a, a good compromise in the middle. It's a, it's a strong, it, it, it's, a, it's a colony that when you get it, you hit the road walking, I guess, because you're not, it's not full size. Um, but like I said, even if you, even if you've got colonies now or you're buying packages this spring, consider you're creating two or three nukes for your bee yard because it's the best bee, piece of beekeeping equipment I can find. And I think that's it. Thank you. No, I think that's a, a great um, idea. I don't know that I've ever you know, kept nukes just for that purpose, but you're right that you can really use those resources um, across any uh, colony that might be struggling. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and see if we all come back. Bingo. Thank you. So that was a lot of information in, in an hour. Uh, <laughs> what? Uh, questions? I think everyone had a question about the bacteria. What's the bacteria called again? Oh, what is that? I, I'm, I'm... It's, it's a beneficial nematode. No, no. Bacillus thuringiensis. I'm yeah. sorry. They, they're advertising in both of the bee journals this month. Okay. And you'll, you'll see, you'll see, and they'll, they'll name the bacteria, but it's the same stuff that, like I said, gardeners use, organic gardeners use, because they can't use poison in their gardens. Mm -hmm. And and they use them to control um, lepidopter larvae, moth and butterfly larvae. And it's, it's a oh, you bacteria, drink. Bacterium thuringiensis. That's it. Thank you, yeah. whoever did that. Um, I mean, you could drink it and, and, and it wouldn't hurt you, but it's death on wax moth larva and you can spray it on equipment that you're storing over winter or, and when you take it out, there'll still be some there and there'll be some protection for um, the colony going through the rest of the season. That's good to know, very good to know. David and Tracy, I think you guys had a question. Yeah, hey, thanks, Sandra. Um, uh -huh. Really good uh, presentation. Thanks for all that. Um, I just had a question early on. You were talking about, you know, not being able to do maximum honey production and treating your bees at the same time. And I wonder what your thoughts were, because um, I know there's been a lot of, you know, studies on this. Oxalic acid is, is quote unquote, kind of a natural treatment. Um, and we use it several weeks in a row to kind of go through the brood cycle to kill mites. But how do you see that as being um, maybe a, a fairly good solution so you're not disturbing the hive too much? Plus, you know, what do you, what do you think it does to the honey? Uh, well, apparently it does nothing for the honey. And, uh, and I think you're right. It is, a, it, is a, it is an acceptable solution to both control mites and make honey. Um, the upside is that you can do both. The downside is the labor issue. Uh, mm -hmm. you and I, you and I can do, you know, 20 colonies in an afternoon. A commercial beekeeper is, you know, that, that picture of all of those bees in the holding yard in California. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> but it is an acceptable solution in a lot of occasions and I have tried it. I don't like it only because it's me, it's not that it doesn't work and it's not that it, what it does to the bees, but um, um, yeah, it's it, 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 acceptable solution, good term. Okay, yeah, I just wondered, that we, we use a ProVap and we do, you know, 150 hives in a, in a day. So it goes pretty fast, but uh, always wondered, you know, the effectiveness and your, your thoughts on that. So thanks for that. Yep. Mm -hmm. labor, labor is the biggest cost commercial beekeepers have by a factor of four. So, you know, the less labor that they can, they, they can put into running their operation, the better off they're gonna be. Good point, yep, thank you. So Anything Kim, else? Kim, we have two questions from Corrine. And the first one is, um, she has a wood roach problem uh, that they get between the inner covers and infest the top of the screen. Any ideas of uh, wood roaches, or do you even have that kind of problem in Ohio? Um, not to the extent that you do, but I have had in the past, and an answer is migratory covers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So uh, for you guys who uh, don't know what a migra migratory cover is, it basically lays flat right on top of the frame. So there is no need for an inner cover. And mm -hmm. so the bees keep that space clean. There's no way for the roaches to really get in or, or bother them. Yep. Yeah. And then her other question is, when you combine colonies, do you kill the old queen? Well, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. And, and um, if you're going to make one colony out of it, you're going to kill one of the queens. Maybe not the old one. Maybe the old one's the good one and the one that you're putting on top isn't any good. But if you're going to make one colony, then one of them has to go someplace. And I'll tell you a good place to put her. Put her in a nuke and keep her in the back. And, and give her a couple of frames of brood and bees. And then you've got, a, you've got that, those frames of brood, and those frames of bees. I mean, if she's good enough to run a colony, <clears throat> she's good enough to run a nuke and it didn't cost you a penny. So get rid of the one that isn't very good, but take the other one and put it in a, a, a nuke in the back. Sometimes you'll combine a colony and there'll be two colonies, one sitting on top of the other, in which case you wouldn't get rid of either one, but you've got something like a double screen between them. Okay, so there would be something in between though, right? So they, yeah. they wouldn't kill each other, right? Yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, I've seen that done also in some wintered hives so that they stay warmer, right? They can't, um, if they're too small, you might put, you know, two colonies together, of course, separated, but it keeps them warmer together. One of the things that you don't have to worry about there that we worry about all of the time is um, ventilation on a, on a wintered colony. And if you've got an upper entrance and you've got a lower entrance, you've got cold air coming in the bottom, warming up in the, in the cluster and keeping going, running, running out the top. And you've got a breeze in your colony all winter and your bees are struggling to keep that air warm. If you think about, if you think about a hollow tree, there's no upper entrance and, and, and there's, no, there's no draft. And what happens is cold air will be drawn in by the bees as they need additional uh, moisture. In the, and, and you'll get condensation around the entrance at the bottom yeah. where it's warm. So you don't have cold air coming up, going out the top or condensing on the roof and dripping down on you. And, and um, well, the other, uh, one, one other thing that goes with that is the, the R value of the boxes that we use is about, about 0.75, where the R value of a tree trunk is anywhere from seven to 11. So the insulative value of a tree trunk is a lot better for me, uh, both summer and winter. So insulating highs both summer and winter in this part of the world is becoming, um, it's just starting to, people are starting to look at it going, which is what we did in Wisconsin. I mean, this is new, um, but, but, but keeping, colonies insulated from summer heat and winter cold uh, by that, you know, an R10 wall makes a lot of sense. What about sugar coating the whole brood? Uh, put a cup full of sugar, powdered sugar over it and put a sticky board right oh, on ver there for Varroa. For Varroa? Yeah. Well, the, the work that was done in Georgia and I think Oregon, don't hold me to that. I know Georgia, it, it, it gets rid of some of the mites, but, but not, not, a, not enough of the mites, but it gets rid of some of them and it's not poison. Exactly. And there's a lot to be said for no poison. So, yeah. you know, know that you're not going to probably control Varroa with it. You'll knock the population down. And, and uh, the time to do that is, is when you no have fall. a new a new queen before she you have sealed brood when you have no sealed brood in the colony um which is a good time to do it you have the most exposed anyway, mite yeah thank you looks like we lost sandy once again um <laughs> i i did see a question during your chat um stan asked what your preferred make and model of pollen trap would be because um the, the, yeah the um 
the people in New York that, that bought out that, that, bought, that bought out what's his name the the where are they the um, he makes the, uh, he makes Miller. he makes I'm sorry is it Miller no no Miller Miller's Miller's okay the oh what's his name uh, um, he makes he makes the comb honey supers you know the round plastic sections oh, and he makes really. and he makes Ross him. Brown. That's the one I like the best. Okay. Sandy's currently in the waiting room. Does anyone else have a, another question while we wait for her to come back to us? Easy crowd. Either you didn't understand anything I said or you understood everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think it was a lot of information. It was really good. Yeah. All right. Still Andy. sinking in. In three days, I'll be like, oh, I should have asked this. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, if I got a moment, I, can I talk about my podcast? Please. Just a moment. We have a podcast. Um, um, beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. You can go to the web page. And there you can. We've been doing it just over two years you can see all the people that we've interviewed we've interviewed some really interesting people um it's free i, I work with a guy out in olympia washington who is a, a hobby beekeeper but a tech but he's a techie he makes zoom work all the time which is why he's here but take a look uh we've got we've done we've talked to some really neat people over the last couple of years and and um i think you'll enjoy it Excellent. Beekeeping Today podcast.com. Very good. All right, Sandy, she should be back. You want me to call Jeff, my partner on the. <laughs> there she is. I got her. Oh, my goodness. Today is just not my technology day. <laughs> All right. Well, it sounds like y'all had some uh, some great questions, and I'm sure amazing answers while I was gone. <laughs> All right. Any other questions that you guys have for Kim? All right. Well, Kim, thank you so much for joining us today. Really enjoyed um, all of your insights and information, and thank you again. Just um, we we just really enjoyed it quite a bit. And um, I was actually perusing your podcast a little bit while you were talking, and there's some great speakers on there. Um, so I can't wait to um, listen to some more of it, um, or to listen to some of it. The titles sound really good too. So yep, there's yep. one on, on interesting bee behavior that I'm going to have to check out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Joe, thanks for your help with, with getting hooked up on this. I appreciate it. And all of the rest of you, thank you for the invitation. It's been fun. And you know, the one thing, that, this is how I do a podcast. I, I sit in front of a computer using Zoom. And, and what, what uh, I'm going to leave you guessing here. What, what I always tell people is that when I'm doing a podcast, I can do it with a glass of wine in my underwear and nobody knows. And nobody would know. <laughs> Although I saw a few of us with our glasses of wine today. So <laughs> Anton, I think Christy, <laughs> I think there's a couple glasses of wine going on, but that's what we love about this. <laughs> Thank you all. Good night. Good Thank luck. You. Stay safe. Thank Bye. you. All right. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole to help with our uh, door prize or virtual door prize. And today we have lots of goodies. Um, we are going to be raffling off two of Kim's books. He's been involved in quite a few over the years and some upcoming. We don't hear Sandy again. Sandy, oh, gosh. seriously, what the heck? <laughs> Am I dead again? No, you're here. We got you. No, we don't. Nope. Nothing. Yep, she's gone. Oh, no, she's here. <laughs> Sandy, we don't hear you. 
Okay, I'm just going to continue on because she's kind of probably going to boot off again. She comes Nicole, back. She real goes, quick on the. Yep. Real quick on the books. Kim's yes. written eight books, and so uh, if if you get drawn for one of the books, since we're going to order from Amazon and have them shipped straight to your house, you can basically pick which whatever one of the eight books that he wrote that you want. That's lovely. Thanks, Joe. Okay. All right. Yeah. So. So for a book, um, so we've the I'm I'm gonna I have the names drawn. So I'm going to um, say the name. If it's you, let us know if you want a book. One of the um, B field guides, like the inspection journal kind of guide. So when you go into your hive, you can take notes or. An HBA t-shirt. <laughs> Those are our door prizes today. So the first one up is Kyle Wolf. You are our first winner. So you can either unmute yourself or you can chat so what you'd like. I see you're here. <laughs> hey there, that's awesome. Um, let me see here i couldn't hear you what the other two prizes were okay so it's it's um thank you a, I want to get any one of kim's books um that in uh like an inspection guide for your hive inspections like to take notes or an hba t-shirt i like an hba t-shirt please you got it thank you you're welcome thanks kyle all <laughs> right Next up, hopefully she is still with us. Becky Stemper, you are our next door prize winner. Hi, how did I win? I never win. You won. <laughs> All right, um, I'll take uh, the book that for record keeping. Oh. Okay, the inspection, got it, cool. Yeah. Thanks, Becky. All Thank right, you. yeah, you're welcome. And let's see, I think my next winner is gone. Oh no, that's what happens when you're not sticking around. Sorry, all right, next up. I, I draw a lot of extra names because people come and go. Um, Lisa Rollinson is our next winner. Hello, Lisa. I'm guessing you're getting a book. Are you cool with that? <laughs> awesome. Um, cool. Do I have to choose or? Yeah, just let us know. Um, look on Amazon. Um, we'll be in touch, but look on Amazon. Go shopping. Just let us know which title you want and we'll ship it straight to your house. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, I'll send you a link. Or a link one of the Thank other. you. Even better. All right. And our final winner for a book. <laughs> Let's see if you are still here. No, you're not. And I back up, back up, back up person. I could kill you guys sometimes. Um, also not here, one more time. I'm gonna generate the numbers. We're only 44 people, it should be pretty easy. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Kyle Clay! Kyle Clay, you are our final winner. Congratulations. You're gonna get a book. <laughs> Oh, Kyle Wolf won a t-shirt. Kyle Clay won. Kyle Wolf, you said you wanted a, okay. Anyway, both Kyles won. So you guys worked it out. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's cool. Uh, we worked it out. Wow, magic. Something worked right tonight. All right, guys. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have um, any other questions, um, feel free to email us info at houstonbeekeepers.org or you can um, ask on our Facebook page. Um, we have a group there under Houston Beekeepers Association. 
Um, please get your nominations in for our board. If you'd like more information on what those positions entail, just email. I'll send those descriptions to you. Anything else? I think we're good. Please join us in November. We're going to have um, Frank Mortimer. He is another author um, and he's going to talk about how he went from beekeeping to books. So it's going to be really great. All right. Cool. Good night, guys. Stay safe. It's in the bee yard.